Hey, I'm Kurt. Welcome to another episode of Fun Space Facts with Kurt. These videos are my attempt at short and sweet and simple explanations about some possibly complex space topics. In this episode, we answer the question, why did it take 11 missions to land our astronauts on the moon's surface back in the 60s? Unless you've been living under a rock, You've probably heard that NASA has recently started up a new human lunar exploration program called Artemis. And the Artemis 3 mission will be the mission that lands our astronauts on the lunar surface. So why did it take us 11 separate missions back in Apollo to land our astronauts on the lunar surface for Apollo 11? Well, the short answer is that we knew next to nothing back then and we had to evolve and test and certify very slowly and very carefully in order to be successful back then. Let's take a quick look at all 11 of those Apollo missions to see what each flight accomplished. Actually, in order to understand the entire evolution and to add context, we'll start all the way back to the very beginning of American human space travel. Project Mercury was our first manned space program. They basically built a small, cramped capsule that had barely enough room for a single astronaut. And then they strapped that capsule to the top of a military ballistic missile. The first two flights were suborbital, sort of like a pop fly in baseball. And then they had four more flights that used a more powerful ballistic missile, which took them all the way into orbit. Project Mercury proved that astronauts could survive the launch forces and the reentry forces, that they could control the spacecraft's pointing direction, that they could live and work and eat and drink and go to the bathroom in zero gravity, and that they could perform science experiments in zero gravity. After Project Mercury, Project Gemini used a larger capsule that could fit two astronauts and it launched on top of an even larger and more powerful ballistic missile. Gemini missions proved that the tasks and the operations that they were planning to do during the future Apollo missions could actually be accomplished. Gemini was basically a proof of concept or a dry run of the Apollo operations, but it was all performed in orbit. Project Gemini proved that astronauts could live and work in space for at least 14 days and at much higher altitudes than the Mercury flights obtained. It also proved that astronauts could do productive work outside the space capsule. And it proved that spacecraft could change their orbits and they could align and connect with each other in space. And Project Gemini also proved that once connected, one of the spacecraft could propel and control the entire connected system in space. So that was the progress and the success that led to the very beginning of Project Apollo. The first Apollo flight was uncrewed and suborbital. It basically tossed up an empty spacecraft in order to test its heat shield during reentry. The second Apollo flight was also uncrewed and suborbital. This flight had a more complete and more operable spacecraft. And that uncrewed spacecraft actually fired its onboard engines during that short suborbital test flight. The third Apollo flight was still uncrewed but this was an orbital mission. It did not have a spacecraft on board though. This mission was a test of the ability to restart the Saturn rocket's engine while in zero gravity, which was a critical event that would be required to boost future manned spacecraft out of Earth orbit and onto a path to the moon. The fourth Apollo flight was intended to be the first crewed test flight of the program, and it was supposed to operate in Earth orbit. NASA was in the process of officially renaming this milestone first crewed mission Apollo 1 when a terrible accident occurred during a countdown dress rehearsal at the Cape. A flash fire erupted inside the spacecraft killing all three astronauts inside. The fifth Apollo flight was uncrewed again but it was an orbital flight. This was the very first test flight of the large Saturn V rocket. The prior test flights all used the smaller Saturn 1B rocket. This test flight carried a fully functional but uncrewed space capsule plus a dummy lunar lander 
This flight configuration allowed the rocket to feel all of the forces that it would feel during a future moon mission. The sixth Apollo flight was also uncrewed and orbital. This was another smaller Saturn 1B mission, and it was the very first test flight of the new lunar lander in space. The lunar lander's descent and ascent engines were both tested on this mission, and they both worked flawlessly. The seventh Apollo flight was once again uncrewed and orbital. This was the second and final test flight of the large Saturn V rocket. Like the first Saturn V flight, this flight carried a fully functional but uncrewed space capsule plus a dummy lunar lander. But this flight certified the Saturn V rocket to carry crew. The eighth Apollo flight was crewed and it was orbital. It used the smaller Saturn 1B rocket to launch the first crewed Apollo space capsule into Earth orbit. The crew spent nearly 11 days living and working inside the space capsule in Earth orbit. This flight certified the Apollo space capsule, also called the Command and Service Module, to go to the moon. Even though this was the eighth Apollo flight, it was officially designated as Apollo 7. This name is definitely confusing because it doesn't gel with all the possible ways that NASA could have counted the flights. The only explanation for the numbers being one off like this is that two different missions ended up getting the Apollo 1 name. The very first test flight, which was uncrewed and suborbital, is now officially called Apollo 1A. And the fourth Apollo mission, which tragically killed the astronauts during a countdown test, was later officially named Apollo 1. The ninth Apollo flight, which was called Apollo 8, was a pretty big deal. It was the first crewed flight of the giant Saturn V rocket. And it was the first mission that went all the way to the moon and back. And it did so with crew on board. They orbited the moon 10 times, but they did not descend to the surface because they only had a dummy lunar lander on board. The Apollo 8 astronauts took the infamous Earthrise photo, the first photo taken of the Earth from lunar orbit. And they made a live television broadcast on Christmas Eve from lunar orbit, where they read verses from the Bible. That live broadcast from lunar orbit was the most watched TV program of all time. The 10th Apollo flight, called Apollo 9, never left Earth orbit but it was the first crewed flight containing a production lunar lander. This flight basically certified the Apollo lunar lander, also called the lunar module, to go to the moon. The 11th Apollo flight, called Apollo 10, was basically a dress rehearsal for landing on the moon. The crew flew their lander down to within 14 kilometers or 8 miles of the lunar surface. That is the point where powered descent for landing would normally begin. If you're wondering why the astronauts didn't go ahead and land, well, they couldn't. Their lunar lander was an early design that was too heavy to make it all the way back if they had landed. It would have been a death sentence if they had gone rogue and performed a lunar lander in that machine. Which brings us to the 12th Apollo flight, Apollo 11 which I don't need to tell you was the first human landing on the moon. And even though it was officially called Apollo 11, it was actually the 12th mission of the Apollo program. So it could have just as easily been called Apollo 12. And so the main reason it took 11 or 12, depending on how you count them, missions to land humans on the moon back then is because the Apollo program had a lot of new hardware to test and certify. There were the Saturn 1B rockets, the Saturn V rockets, the space capsules, the lunar landers, the spacesuits, and a whole lot more. And when you see all that they accomplished in those 12 missions, it's pretty amazing. Well, that does it for another episode of Fun Space Facts with Kurt. Thanks for your interest and thank you for watching. Stay tuned to this channel for more episodes in the near future. Bye.